Hi, I'm the Guitar Trooper, YouTube's favorite old guy. It was November 4th, 1965 at 11.50 p.m. in the dimly lit control room of Studio 3 at Western Recorders in Los Angeles, California. Producer Lou Adler, the owner of his new company Dunhill Records, hit the playback stop button for the Ampex 300-4 four-track recorder, looked at his colleague Dayton Bones Howe, and nodded with a grin. He felt confident that his decision to switch an unknown vocal quartet on the version of the new song that he just played would result in a hit, even though he essentially had them record a cover of their own song. John Phillips, Michelle Phillips, Denny Doherty, and Cass Elliott were the quintessential starving artists and were virtually unknown to the public, having only done a few studio background singing gigs since they got together. They had, at first, expected only to do the background vocals on this recording, being made by a mutual friend, Barry McGuire, just to get some desperately needed cash. They didn't know then that the two-minute, 37-second re-recording that they had just completed at Lou Adler's bidding, a song written by John and Michelle two years earlier, overlaying the original recorded version just made by Barry McGuire, would send them on a career journey that they would never forget. It is the winter of 1963 in a frozen New York City, and 19-year-old Michelle Phillips, who had just moved there a year earlier from California with her new husband John, gazes out of her apartment window at a swirling and ever-increasing accumulation of snow. John was a songwriter and frequently used Michelle's lyrical ideas in his compositions. They were experiencing one of the worst winters in 50 years on the U.S. East Coast, and the weather was brutally cold and snowy. Michelle, being a California girl, had never seen a snowflake in her life. So, less than enamored with the white blanket covering the city, she longed to return to California. John, who grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, had no problem at all with cold weather. Still, the situation gave John an idea for a song about someone wanting to return to a place of their memories. He woke up Michelle at 2 a.m. to have her help him work out a song. Although resentful at the time of awakening from a sound sleep, she later would admit that it was the best wake-up call that she ever got because it attached her name as a co-writer to a song destined to sell millions of records worldwide. Eventually, John and Michelle were to move back to California in 1964 and join two other vocalists, Denny Doherty and Cass Elliott, to form the group that would be named by Cass as Mamas, inspired by the name used by Motorcycle Club Girlfriends, and the Logical Papas, since there were two guys in the group, too. Times were tough in 1965 for the new vocal group, the Mamas and the Papas, and there was barely enough cash to support the monthly rent. John discovered that a friend from the folk singer days, Barry McGuire, was living in L.A., and Cass Elliott looked him up. Barry, formerly a singer with the New Christie Minstrels, had met John, Michelle, and Denny in Greenwich Village back in 1962 when the Minstrels were on tour in New York. He had since left the Minstrels and had launched a solo recording career with a new record company named Dunhill Records. He had scored an early 1965 hit with a song called Eve of Destruction and was in the process of recording songs for a follow-up album. After Cass's call, he came over to hear the group sing in their apartment and was impressed. He promised to recommend them to the owner of Dunhill Records, Lou Adler, and it was a well-placed opportunity because the four singers were out of work and absolutely broke. In gratitude for Barry's consideration in recommending them to Lou, the Mamas and the Papas gave him the song that John and Michelle had composed during that very cold winter in New York two years before, and Barry reciprocated, inviting them to sing back up on the recording session in order to provide them with some much-needed cash. 
Thursday, November 4th, 1965, 8 p.m., Western Recorders, Los Angeles, California. Barry McGuire and the Mamas and the Papas are in Studio 3 to record the vocals for John and Michelle's song, the instrumental backing track having already been laid down with studio musicians earlier that week. The complement of musicians that had recorded the instrumental track were among L.A.'s best. They were part of a select but loosely defined group collectively referred to as the Wrecking Crew because of the reputation that they amassed in earlier years as studio decorum nonconformists. On that session, the personnel list reads like a who's who. Hal Blaine on drums, Larry Nechtel on piano, Joe Osborne on bass, and P.F. Sloan on guitar, who had also worked out an intro with John Phillips playing the 12-string guitar along with him. Barry himself played a harmonica solo during that earlier session, too. Studio 3 is small, and five people fill it up. The vocalists are in a line with three RCA DX77 microphones on booms that allow suspension of the devices directly in front of the singers without risk of contact with a mic stand. Barry stands three feet to the right of his backup singers with his own mic. To his left are Denny and John on one microphone and to their left are Michelle and Cass on another. All five singers wear headphones carrying not only the backing track, but all of the live voices being added to it. Lou starts the backing track playback to the headphones, and Barry sings the lead, with his backup singers providing echoing lyrics for each line of the chorus. After the overdub is recorded, Lou Adler plays back the results and frowns. The recording simply doesn't work. Barry's voice, a low-register monotonic drone, doesn't fit the song at all, and neither does his dreary harmonica solo, but otherwise, the instruments and the background vocals are amazing. Lou gets an idea. The background singers have the right sound. Barry had introduced them to Lou, and he knew that John and Michelle had written the song that Barry just recorded. Lou asks if another studio is open, and Studio 2 is. To confirm his hunch, he has the Mamas and the Papas alone in Studio 2 for an audition where they sing California Dreamin' with only John's guitar as backup and Denny Doherty singing the lead. And after they finish, there's a pause when they hear Lou's voice over the talkback mic. You got any more? John comes back, got any more? Sure we got more. John recalled, We sang him everything we had. We sang him straight shooter, Monday, Monday, go where you want to go. He kept asking, do you got any more? Finally, Cass says, that's all we got. What do you think? And Lou says, I think we can do business. In fact, Lou hands them a $100 bill as a down payment to convince them to sign a recording contract with Dunhill Records, beginning with a full vocal recording of the new song, California Dreamin'. Lou plays out his intuition, using the same instrument backing track that was used for Barry's version, Lou has the group re-record their song with Denny singing the lead vocal. Unlike the side-by-side -side setup used when they were doing the background track for Barry, Bones Howe uses two RCA DX77 microphones, one for the guys and one for the girls, back-to-back -back and set up to a cardioid pickup pattern, providing excellent isolation of the sound at the front of the mics only. The two pairs of singers face each other as they sing, with Denny walking around to the girls' mic when he's singing the lead vocal lines. Besides having a voice much more suited to pop music, Denny sings the song an octave higher than Barry, giving the lead much more sonic buoyancy. The difference, when compared to Barry's vocal, is striking. The vocals are laid down in short order. The issue of replacing the harmonica solo, which Lou found to his ear to be out of character for the song, still lingered. It had to go. 
To prepare for adding another overdub, the vocals were bounced and doubled to a second Ampex 300-4 with Bones making sure that the vocals were isolated on channel 3 from the instruments on channel 1 and 2. But what would replace it? Lou and Bones discuss possible solutions. A harmonica obviously wasn't right, but Lou doesn't want a sax solo either because it's just too common. John Phillips walks out of the studio, and there in the hallway is Bud Shank, who is a first call session guy for sax and flute, waiting in between takes on a recording to which he is assigned in another studio. John asks him if he could do a short flute fill for them in Studio 3 after he finishes with the session he's already working. At 11 p.m., Bud Shank walks into Studio 3 with his alto flute in hand. Shank listens to the hole in the song that he is supposed to fill with a flute solo and extemporaneously composes one. It is then that he discovers that the playback pitch is not consistent. Somewhere in the midst of the master tape manipulation, probably during the track reduction recording, the otherwise almost imperceptible 0.1% speed variance at 15 inches per second in each of the two Ampex machines was magnified, causing the resulting recording to slowly change pitch during the course of the song. Bud is perplexed with a problem that is never faced in a live performance. Not only is the backing track at a musical key somewhere between C-sharp minor and D at the beginning of the solo slot, but it also slowly drops back to C-sharp minor by the end of it, creating a situation that requires Bud to decide in which key to play the solo, either the odd sharp pitch at the beginning of the solo slot or the true key pitch at the end of it. Knowing that the singers would begin a new verse immediately after the solo, Bud chooses true C-sharp minor for the solo key to match the pitch of the backing track at the point before the verse begins. This explanation, by the way, is supportable in theory only. The true reason for the pitch wandering, whether technical or artistic, is not really clear and remains a mystery to this day. Bud Shank dons his headphones in order to monitor the backing track and his solo as he plays it and, ignoring the pitch mismatch at the beginning, nails the solo in a single take. The recording is now complete. But even with the mamas and the papas doing all of the vocal parts, due to the guitar intro occupying the same track as Barry Maguire's original vocal, and in spite of Bones Howe's best efforts to scrub the original vocal, a fractional snippet of Barry's voice remains audible behind the new overdub on the first two words in the song, because there was no way in the four-track analog recording days for engineer Bones Howe to completely eliminate that vestige of Barry's opening vocal, without losing continuity of the preceding guitar intro. If you listen very closely to the left channel of the stereo version, you can hear the first three words of Barry Maguire's original vocal still preserved on that recording to this day. Barry Maguire, the man who wanted to help his friends get some cash and ended up providing them with a career launching pad, let his recording of California Dreamin' remain unreleased on his This Precious Time album. After his first number one hit in 1965 with Eve of Destruction, Barry McGuire would never again have a top 40 single. After a few years with other new albums and new recording contracts, Barry migrated his solo recording career to the contemporary Christian realm in 1971. California Dreamin' by the Mamas and the Papas, their vocals recorded over an existing master tape on a hunch by Lou Adler, peaked at number four on the Billboard Top 100 chart and was eventually certified as a three-time platinum record in both the UK at over 1,800,000 copies and in the US at over 3 million copies. Their second single release, Monday, Monday, would go all the way to number one. 
Lou Adler once said regarding the first time that he had heard them sing together, I actually thought that must have been how George Martin felt after he heard the Beatles. A later quip by Bones Howe was that they should have recorded everything possible before the group became popular because, along with the stress of fame, internal personal problems and drug use tore the group apart. Their last studio album, People Like Us, would be released in 1971 and peak at a dismal number 84. Dunhill Records was bought out in 1973 by ABC, creating ABC Dunhill. ABC looked at their accounting books and decided that retention of old master tapes from the Dunhill Library was too expensive to justify. Based upon that decision, all of the original Mamas and Papas multi-track recordings and masters, including their first hit California Dreamin' and their number one hit Monday Monday and every other original, were destroyed, leaving original albums and tapes reproduced before that time as the only remaining artifacts of the group that got their first hit by covering their own songs. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please click that like button and leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. You can also use comments to suggest video subject matter regarding pop music between the 1950s and the 1970s. This would also be a great time to subscribe to the channel if you're not yet a subscriber, and if you are already a subscriber, consider upgrading your subscription to channel member status by hitting that join button on the videos or on the main screen in the YouTube browser window. Channel members have the ability to see new videos days before they are released to the general public, plus they have exclusive access to guitar tutorials on some of my favorite songs. Thanks again for watching.